Good. Uh, awesome. Okay. Uh, what would be the plan? Uh, we want to talk about um, Turing machines which run for longer than infinity. For that, we first require a good notion of infinity, which is why we need the crash course on ordinal numbers, numbers which are larger than infinity. And then we will get to those actual infinite time Turing machines. Here, they are just called super Turing machines. And perhaps if we want to, we can then make the connection to what we learned today in the lecture, in the, in the final uh, chapter. But let's start and see um, where we get carried to and whether you like it, how you like it, and so on and so forth. Um, so we start with a crash course on ordinal numbers. And let me just quickly check that the camera is correctly recognizing this one because I don't have this as slides. Just a second. Yeah, looks good. At least if we restrict to this, this fragment of the board. Yes, okay, good. Okay, um, uh, you know the natural numbers, zero, one, two, and so on. Let me for a second um, perhaps make the screen black and activate the window, the, the light for that. I'll just press random buttons so that you can see it more clearly. Awesome. Good. You know the natural numbers. Um, and perhaps you also know like the rational numbers which fit in between, the real numbers which fit in between. Uh, but most likely you don't know about the numbers going beyond the natural numbers to the right, which are larger than all the natural numbers. Perhaps you do because you like took a course in set theory or something, but it's not part of any standard curriculum I personally know. The first number which goes, uh, which is larger than all those numbers um, would be called infinity, okay? But we don't use the symbol instead we use uh, the omega uh, symbol uh, simply because we want to be more specific. The infinity symbol is also used in all sorts of other contexts. Like when you say love is infinite, okay? Then you're perhaps also using the symbol. Here I actually mean the concrete number omega. Um, let me just check that the connection working again. Yes, okay. Good, that is, um, but that is just the first infinitely large number. Um, smallest infinitely large number. And more precisely, it's, in so, it's a so-called ordinal number. There are also other flavors of infinitely large numbers. This is about the ordinals. And it's not the final infinitely large number. Do you know an infinitely large number which is larger than omega? Omega plus one, indeed. And then omega plus two. And then omega plus three and omega plus four and so on and so forth. And then a number which is larger than all of these. Two omega, right? Omega plus omega, which I can also write as two omega. And then at some point we have three omega, four omega, five omega, and so on and so forth. And then at some point we have omega times omega, which um, can also be written as omega squared. And then at some later point, we have omega to the three, omega to the four, and so on. And then omega to the omega. And then at some even later point, we have omega to the omega to the omega. And then even later we have Omega to the omega to the omega to the omega to the omega and so on and so forth. We have an infinite tower of omegas stacked on top of each other. The number resulting from this computation has a name. It's called epsilon zero. And that's not the biggest number because we can always add one to obtain even larger numbers like epsilon zero plus one. We can also progress um, faster by passing to epsilon zero, to the epsilon zero, to the epsilon zero, to the epsilon zero, and so on. So an infinite tower of epsilon zeros, then <laughs> resulting number has a name, it's called epsilon one. 
Now we could stack infinitely many epsilon ones to obtain epsilon two, then stack infinitely many epsilon twos to obtain epsilon three and so on. And at some point we will have epsilon omega, the omega epsilon number. And then at some even later point, we will have the omega plus one epsilon number. And then at some even later point, we will have the epsilon zero epsilon number. And then we will have the epsilon, epsilon, epsilon zeros epsilon number. And you see where this is going because at some point we will have this number, epsilon, 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 epsilon stacked to the bottom an infinite amount of time. That's the supremum over all the earlier epsilon epsilons with more and more epsilons to the index in the index. And the resulting number has a name, it's called zeta zero. And then you can continue with zeta zero, stack it on top of each other, obtain zeta one and so on and so forth. And gradually uh, it will get harder and harder to give names to those ordinal numbers. At some point you are running out of Greek letters in the alphabet, no worries, then you switch to a more mathematical version of an alphabet where you don't have like a fixed stock of characters. Instead, you just number all your characters in your alphabet by the natural numbers. So you have a letter number 500, letter number 1 million. At some point, you use the order numbers themselves to index the letters of your alphabet. But also this procedure will run out of gas at some point, and then you need even more advanced ideas to give names to that large ordinals. Uh, at some point you, you obtain open research problems. That's a very quick tour of the beginnings of the ordinal number line. And before you think that numbers like this are huge, in some sense they are huge, they are much larger than three, um, and they are also much larger than just omega, for instance, um, uh, let me shock you by relating the following fact. Um, any given ordinal number has a certain set of its predecessors. For instance, uh, the set of predecessors of the number three is the three element set containing zero, one, and two. Or the set of predecessors of omega is the set of all natural numbers. And uh, you can ask how large are these sets of predecessors? You know that um, there are some infinite sets in mathematics are countable and others are uncountable. And perhaps in constructive mathematics, there are also sets for which you cannot tell, but at least some sets are countable and others are uncountable. A set is countable if it's in bijection with the natural numbers. So if you can make a list of all the elements in that set using just natural numbers for indexing the elements in that set. And it turns out that all the numbers depicted here have just a countable set of predecessors. Okay, so using some clever argument, uh, which uh, is getting more and more clever as long uh, as uh, the, the more you advance in the natural in the order numbers line, you can always make a complete list of all the predecessors using just natural numbers for indexing that list. There are also order numbers for which the set of predecessors is an uncountable set, but these didn't appear here. That's a prime on order numbers. I would like to remove this list and instead uh, give you another way of thinking, of visualizing those order numbers. Um, if you are ready to remove that, yes. So um, how to think about the number omega plus one? I think about the number omega as follows. We have the post office and in front of the post office, there are infinitely many people waiting in an infinitely long queue, um, all of them wanting uh, to, carry out, uh, some, to, to carry out some business at the post office. However, it's a very uh, slow post office. Um, it require, will require one full day in order to process an incoming request. So uh, this person will only get served on day three, this person will get served on day four, five, six, and so on. So that's Omega. That's a graphical depiction of Omega because there are infinitely many people, Omega many people waiting in line. 
how should we draw omega plus one? Right, it's so it, it kind of should go here. However, doesn't that doesn't really make sense? So the the law of physics did not forbid me from drawing this picture on this board. However, the picture doesn't make sense right now because those dots indicate that this should go on forever. I cannot put a person up after forever. But many of you have read Harry Potter, right? Okay. In Harry Potter, a magical bus appears, which from the outside looks like an ordinary London style bus, but from the inside, it's much larger, right? Let's use this kind of magical bus to fix the visualization. So that's a magical bus, bus from the outside, it's just 10 meters. From the inside, it, it just has one door, just at the front, there's no door in the back, just at the front, there's a door. And then like the true size uh, of the bus uh, becomes apparent, namely um, it is of infinite size. You, you have like an infinitely long um, um, yeah, interior of the bus um, and all those um, uh, seats are numbered by the ordinary natural numbers. Seat number zero, seat number one, seat number two, and so on and so forth. There's no, final seat, no last seat in here. There's always one more seat. Okay, but outside the bus, we have this person. When will this person get served by the post office? Never, Never is a pessimistic way of giving a correct answer. Is there a pos is there an optimistic way as well? Let's just be, you lose, use like colorful language. Let's say this person, uh, she's called Anna, by the way. Anna will get served after the end of time, which is quite a bit of time, which is why Anna is sad, but not as sad as Mustafa, because when will Mustafa get served? Well, he has to wait till the end of time and then sleep for one more night and then only then he will get served. That is Omega plus two. And now we can continue in a similar manner. For instance, omega plus omega is infinitely many of those. Um, and if you want to progress beyond that, to have omega plus omega plus one, for instance, you put all of these again into a magical bus. Um, how should we draw um, omega squared plus one? A bus of buses, a so-called meta bus, indeed. So meta, meta buses have like this, this symbol, uh, this icon at the upper right, and um, the contents of a meta bus are not persons, but buses. Like this, uh, there's a bus parking spot zero, a bus parking spot one, a bus parking spot two, and so on. And then beyond that meta bus, we have Jenny. Jenny is infinitely sad because she will have to wait for the end of time, then for a new end of time, then for a new, new end of time and so on. And only after infinitely many ends of times have passed, she will get served by the post office. And perhaps you uh, like to think about how to draw omega to the three, omega to the four or omega to the omega. This will be more complex. Um, uh, it will not just be an infinitely nested collection of buses, it will be more complex. Um, what I just want to indicate right now is one final fun fact, namely let's go back to smaller numbers. Let's picture one plus omega instead of omega plus one. How should we draw one plus omega? Right, like this. And do you notice anything in particular about this situation, especially in comparison to omega plus one? The last one, the last one. 
Yes and no. No, because there is no last person in the bus. There's always one more. Recall the persons in the bus are indexed by the ordinary natural numbers and there's no largest natural number. But yes. Um, yes, indeed, uh, like if it starts to rain and that person wants to see cover, um, uh, that person, Anna, I guess, uh, again, uh, can like enter the bus and ask all those people to, to move one to the right. And then the first seat will be free and Anna can take it. Indeed. Um, um, and this shows that regarding cardinality, um, there is no difference between omega and omega plus one. Regarding the amount of persons, there's no difference. But regarding the ordering, there is a difference. With omega plus one, there was a person who needed, to, Anna, who needed to wait till the end of time till they get served. That was not the case with omega. With omega, every person gets served in this aeon of time. And how about one plus omega? You already indicated it. Here also, nobody has to wait till the end of time. Everybody gets served in our current aeon. And hence, one plus omega is omega in them. Unlike omega plus one, which is a strictly larger number, um, one plus omega is just omega again. Huh? So not all laws of, um, um, of ordinary natural numbers carry over, over to the ordinary numbers. Some do like associativity, but not commutativity. Exercise uh, also disprove, disprove using these pictures that ordinal multiplication is not commutative. I will now go back to the slides. You now have the basics of ordinal numbers. Let me just make a very tiny final comment about that. Namely, um, where I wrote alpha times beta, Wikipedia would write beta times alpha. Um, so I'm saying that the convention I personally use for multiplication is opposite of the standard rotation just so um, you, are, you don't get confused when you look up results. That's about the order numbers. Any questions, comments, suggestions? Okay. Then let's talk about infinite time Turing machines. This one. This is an artist's depiction of an ordinary Turing machine. Um, as I think most of you know, um, an ordinary Turing machine um, has access to an, a tape. Uh, that tape is subdivided into individual cells. Each cell contain, may contain zero or one. That, high, uh, that tape is infinitely long. Um, more precisely, it has like at least in this depiction, length omega to the right and also length omega to the left. Um, and then there is a central control unit, which is like this. And um, this unit um, does its, this is like the core of the machine. It, it is uh, the thing governing the computation. In each computational step, it can have a look at the current cell contents and then decide what to do with the cell contents. Um, it may decide to override this one with a zero or keep it as is. And then it may also move this head to the one to the right or one to the left. And then perhaps uh, at some point, uh, such a Turing machine will come to a conclusion, will stop, will terminate, or it might also continue for, uh, for infinity. That's about ordinary Turing machines. And let's now see the difference to super Turing machines. Um, just want to mention a couple of fun facts. One is the concept of Turing machines, ordinary Turing machines, is astoundingly robust in the sense that many variants are imaginable, but they all turn out to be equivalent at the end. For instance, it doesn't make a difference whether the tape is of infinite size to both sides 
or whether it uh, just goes in one direction and has a clear beginning uh, in the other direction. Or it doesn't make a difference uh, if we use several tapes, five tapes, so that we have a couple of scratch tapes. Um, it also doesn't make a difference whether we allow more symbols instead of just two on the tape. All those kinds of variations don't uh, play a role if we are only concerned with general questions of computability and disregard questions of efficiency. Um, also, a nice fun fact, in case you are a mathematician and not a computer scientist, uh, because then um, you might not be particularly interested in Turing machines, or, or at least you won't have any a priori interest in Turing machines. However, let me state the following. Um, a subset of the natural numbers is enumerable by a Turing machine, if and only if it's a sigma one set. I will explain what a sigma one set is in a second. Before that, let me explain what, uh, uh, what this enumerability means. Uh, that means that there's a Turing machine which um, outputs in some order all the uh, inhabitants of that subset that is enumerable by a Turing machine. For instance, the set of prime numbers is enumerable by a Turing machine because there's a Turing machine which can output um, all the prime numbers in some ordering. There's even a Turing machine which can output uh, the prime numbers in their order. Um, but in particular, it can be, it can output, it's just the fact that it can be output as well uh, in any in order. What's a sigma one set? A sigma one set is a subset of the natural numbers which looks like this. It's a certain set of natural numbers such that some condition holds. And here this condition needs to be a sigma one condition uh, by which it's meant it's a condition which starts out with a couple of existential quantifiers and then something. And in that something, um, uh, there, there's a certain restriction. Uh, no further existential quantifiers may appear there. Also no further universal quantifiers only um, equals top, bottom, and, or, and implies. So a quantor free formula. Well, that's a sigma one set, um, a very um, natural kind of set from the point of view of logic. On first sight, it doesn't have anything to do with string machines. However, in fact, it does. A uh, subset is of this form, if and only if it's enumerable by some Turing machine. Yeah, so this gives you a link between Turing machines and what? Turing machines were invented by Alan Turing as a theoretical notion. Uh, there's the movie Imitation Game um, about uh, Alan Turing and his work. If you remember, he cracked the Enigma, the uh, encryption device of Nazi Germany. Um, that movie also discusses the fact that uh, Turing was gay, which was a crime back then. Uh, and indeed, in the end, uh, Alan Turing was driven into suicide. And uh, I think 10 years ago, the Queen officially apologized for that. Of course, it was too late for Alan Turing. And um, in case you watch that movie or in case you watch any movie, I recommend a test proposed by Alison Bechtel um, she proposes uh, to not only in arbitrarily enjoy movies, but also think about the following. Does the movie contain at least two female characters who have names and talk to each other and not about men? We call that real life validates the Bechtel test, but many, many Hollywood movies do not. I think what this one does, but also just barely uh, I think it's worth to, to keep this test in mind when, when watching movies. That's Turing machines. Now, super Turing machines. Um, so, an ordinary Turing machine can carry out computational steps one after another, and we could index all those computational steps, and we could index them by the ordinary natural numbers. So there's a zero computation step, a first one, a second, a third, a fourth, and so on. With infinite time Turing machines, uh, or for short, super Turing machines, 
um, it's the same, except that we now use the full ordinal number line in order to index our computational steps. So uh, Super Turing machine is capable of doing some computation on day omega or on day omega plus one or on day omega times two plus one or on day zeta zero and so on and so forth. And um, we need a couple of agreements in order to arrive at a coherent notion. Um, for instance, picture the following situation. You have a super Turing machine and it proceeds as follows. It moves the head one to the right and then one to the left, then one to the right, then one, one to the left, right, left, right, left. Okay, forever. Where will the head be on day omega? That's hard to tell. There's some argument that it should be there. There's also some argument that it should be there. Okay. We need some kind of agreement in order to arrive at a well-defined notion. And the agreement here is that the head is moved to the start of the tape. The, in that flavor of the Super 2 machines, the tape um, uh, has a definite beginning. And then it goes on and on and on uh, of length omega in that in one direction. And on limit days, like omega or omega times two, um, the head is moved to the very beginning. Um, let's think about a different issue, which is then solved by this agreement here. Consider the following infinite time Turing machine. Um, it puts a zero at the current position on the tape. Then it removes that zero and puts a one. Then a zero, then a one, then a zero, always at the same position on the tape. What should be the contents of that cell at day on day omega? Should it be zero? Should it be one? It was infinitely often both. Could consider the following thing machine. Um, it puts a zero there. And then it remains zero for 10 time steps. Then it uh, it's, uh, the Turing machine changes it into a one and then into zero again. And then for 10 time step uh, steps, it's, that does nothing. So now perhaps you would be inclined to say, well, it should be a zero on day omega because it was a zero much more often than a one. And I, I would be sympathetic to that kind of reasoning, but the official definition put forward by Joel David Hempkins and Andy Lewis of whom I did not manage to find a photo, um, is to set the contents to the lean soup of the previous contents. That means the following, um, in case the contents stabilized at some value, then it's that value. But in case infinitely often there were changes, it's just fixed to one. So if, if in doubt, the cell will be one instead of zero. You might have encountered Joel David Hempkins from Math Overflow uh, because he's a very um, a prolific contributor to Math Overflow. At some point, I think he was contributor number one to Math Overflow. And I really recommend his, uh, his answers and also his questions. Uh, they are quite insightful. Final agreement we need to, um, to carry out this one here. We call a Turing machine has a finite list of states. Also a super Turing machine just has a finite list of states. A super Turing machine is still a finite object. It's just that it can operate for longer than infinity, but in itself, it's a finite object. Um, and it could be that um, the, uh, such a super Turing machine um, yeah, is in one state, then in, the, in another, then in one, then another, and so on and so forth. And again, the question would be in which state is it on day omega or on other limit days? And the definition is that it will be in a designated limit state, which we just specify when writing down the super Turing machine. That's what super Turing machines are. Uh, next, we will have an example. Uh, but do you have any questions, comments, wishes right now?
Okay, then I have a question for you. Here I describe a super Turing machine and my question will be, what does it do? The super Turing machine proceeds as follows. Um, so it has a start state. Um, and in that start state, it does the following. It checks whether the current cell contains a one. If yes, then it stops. And else, it briefly sets it to one, but then sets it to zero again, and then goes to the right, to the right, to the right, to the right. And in that designated limit state, it just does, it does just the same. So what does it do? So that's a tape. In the beginning, it's initialized with zeros. In its first step, compression step, it changes this into a one, then into a zero again, and then moves here, but doesn't change it. Move there, move there, move there, and so on and so forth. What is the state on day omega? It's zero again here because it was, while it was one briefly, it has settled into zero. It's stabilized at the value zero. And the um, hat will again point at the very beginning because that was our agreement. And the state of the super Turing machine will be that special limit state. Okay, then um, we are now on day omega plus one. This will get changed into one, then into a zero. And then the head is moved to the right without end. And at some point it will be the day two times omega. There it will be here in the front again. And it will be a zero again because while it was uh, one briefly, it settled into zero. Okay. Now, um, yeah, what will happen? Yeah, does it again and again? So let me ask differently, will this machine ever stop? No? At least it didn't stop till time omega times two or two times omega, I don't care right now about the convention. And we could continue this explanation for a bit and see that it also does not st uh, stop um, within uh, 20 times omega days or 200 times omega days. Um, I wrote a simulation of that machine. Uh, let's um, run this simulation. Um, So here we have um, the description of that state. Uh, let me uh, increase the font size. It's called flash of flag. Um, so um, there are three states in total, a start state, a limit state, and a go state. In the go state, it does the following. It ignores what's written on the tape. It always moves to the right, puts a zero again on the tape because I need to write something there. And then the new state of the two machine will be go again. Okay, and in both the start state and the limit state, um, the behavior is as follows. In case there's a zero, then stay at the same position, but write a one there and then go to that go state, which overrides it with the zero again, and then goes to the right. Um, but if it encounters a one, then hold. Okay, so that is um, um, the Turing machine. Now let's simulate it. Oh. 
Okay, it briefly flashed that one and then went to the right. And now let's increase the simulation speed so that we can uh, watch the entirety of the simulation in a finite amount of time. And then you will notice that it stopped at time omega squared in contradiction of what we said. Um, and that simulation is indeed correct. Why? Can anyone explain? Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Exactly. Up to day, let's say one million times omega, that first cell will have flashed to one, one million times approximately, or by one person. But then it will have settled to to uh, uh, to, to to, to zero, yeah? So it, one million exceptions, but other than that, zero. So it settled. But at day omega squared, it was a one for an infinite amount of days. Hence, it did not settle. And hence, it's forced to be one by our agreement. The condition is that on how many times it will one. Yeah. Yeah, right, indeed, exactly, yeah. Do you want to see the source code of that simulation? Okay. Okay, here we have a plot-in routine which outputs the tape contents, okay. And then here, I did not carry out any computation, which would be impossible for an ordinary laptop. Instead, I just hard coded the animation. So not really a simulation. Good. Uh, the moral of the story is that superting machines can break out of some kinds of infinite loops. It appeared to be trapped in an infinite loop. But a closer look inspected that this Turing machine did hold after a long amount of time, namely on day Omega square. Okay, uh, what is it that super Turing machines can do? Uh, well, firstly, super Turing machines can do everything what an ordinary Turing machine can do. But then uh, there are lots of things um, which go beyond the power of ordinary Turing machines, for instance. Um, a super Turing machine can verify number theoretic statements, um, by which I mean any first order statement formulated in the language of Peano or Heiting arithmetic uh, containing an arbitrary amount of universal and existential quantifiers. For instance, an infinite time Turing machine can check whether there are infinitely many prime twins. We call a prime twin is something like five, seven or 11, 13, two primes, which have just one even number in between them. Currently, it's unknown whether they, they are infinitely many of them. The super Turing machine can just check that. Uh, it runs through the uh, number line, keeping track of the, um, the print, print, uh, twin primes. And then on day omega, inspects uh, like the status, whether it has found infinitely many or, or not. In fact, that particular example was, uh, uh, from the point of view of a super Turing machine, was a very simple example because it just required omega days in order to carry out that procedure. Not omega to the omega to the omega many, many days, just mere omega many days. Yeah? You will find other statements which can be decided by a super Turing machine for which you require more time. But the next example here on the slide is yet again an example for a simple statement from the point of view of a super Turing machine. It can determine whether a given ordinary Turing machine terminates just simulate it and then on day omega check whether it has stopped. Super Turing machines can also simulate other two Super Turing machines. However, they cannot check whether a given Super Turing machine terminates. That's the halting problem again. Uh, the ordinary proof of the halting, um, of the undecidability of the halting problem 
uh, carries uh, works just as well for super tuning machines instead of ordinary tuning machines. Instead, uh, in, in fact, it works for um, most, perhaps every model of computation depends on the definition of model of computation. Perhaps astoundingly, uh, super tuning machines can also decide so called pi 1 1 and sigma 1 1 statements with that capital one or like uh, superscript one. Um, what's a pi 1 1 statement? A pi 1 1 statement is a statement of this form for every function from n to n. It holds that. And then in here, um, no more function quantifiers may appear, only ordinary number quantifiers about for all n and n or exists n and n. Um, of, of arbitrary kind, so um, universals, existentials, mixed, whatever. The restriction is uh, just that there's uh, just one function quantifier, and this needs to be at the very beginning of the statement. That's a sigma 1 1 statement, a pi 1 1 statement, and the sigma 1 sta 1 1 statement is the same, just that we don't have a universal quantifier in the beginning, but an existential quantifier, existential function quantifier at the beginning. And then again, no further function quantifiers of any kind, but arbitrary number quantifiers. This is quite astounding that a super trig machine can do that. Perhaps you see why it's so, um, so especially astounding. If you check how many functions are there from N to N. Countably many or uncountably many? Can you make a full list indexed by the natural numbers containing all functions from N to N? Here, I really mean all functions, all set theoretical functions, and not every set theoretical function can be encoded as an, uh, can be coded as an algorithm. Indeed, there are uncountably many uh, functions from end to end. If I really mean, unlike briefly in today's morning lecture, if I really mean all functions. Uh, let me quickly prove that. Um, So theorem, um, n to the n, by this I mean the set of all functions from n to n, the set of all functions from n to n is uncountable, is uncountably large, proof. Uncountable is by definition uh, the negation of countable. And I will now do. Uh, I will now present a constructive proof, which, however, will still contain the word contradiction. But that's fine because we will just prove a negated statement. So assume, for the sake of contradiction, um, uh, that uh, n to the n is countable, so that there is an enumeration of all the elements of n to the n by the naturals. By enumeration, I mean the following. We have a function f. And the outputs of that function are um, uh, functions from n to n in such a way that every function from n to n is contained in the range of that function. So every function from n to n occurs as the value um, of f at some appropriate input. That would be an enumeration. Um, now we define something. I will define a function alpha from n to n. And I will define it as follows. The input n will be mapped to 
f of n of n plus one, like this. So f of n here is some function from n to n. I feed into that function, the particular input n, the result will be some number, and then I add one. That is something I can do. Now by assumption, f enumerates all the functions from n to n, hence in particular, it enumerates that alpha. By assumption, there is a number, I will call that n0, such that f of n0 is precisely alpha. So that's some function from n to n, and that is some function from n to n, and they are the same. So in particular, they will have the same function values everywhere. So in particular, they will have the same value um, on input n0. So it will follow that f of n0 of n0 is the same as alpha of n0. But now check that this is a contradiction because alpha of n0 is f of n0 of n0, so exactly what's written on the left, plus one contradiction. So there are uncountably many functions from n to n. However, the tape uh, which a supertube machine can, can use to carry out its work still is of countable length. It's, there's just one cell for each natural number. This, the tape is of the same size as with ordinary tube machines. And that is why this is so especially interesting. Uh, but it still works. And uh, you, using clever ideas, uh, which are more clever than just checking the statement in question for every function from end to end in turn, because that will not work because there are uncountably many functions from end to end. So we cannot check them turn by turn. And also, by the way, there are functions from end to end which are not computable, not even by a super Turing machine. Hence, um, uh, even if time wouldn't be an issue, a super Turing machine can still not check something for every function from end to end because it doesn't have access to all functions, but still it holds true. Okay, so it's quite amazing. And um, it turns out that um, for carrying out these kinds of checks, uh, a supertube machine needs much, much more time than just omega or omega to the omega. It needs really a long amount of time. But there are still limits um, uh, to what a supertube machine can do. It can't compute all functions. And also it cannot write every infinite zero one sequence on the tape. It can write down many zero one, infinite zero one sequences on the tape, for instance, that infinite sequence, which has zeros everywhere, just once there at prime numbered positions, that is something which is possible. And also many other things are possible, but it cannot write down every imaginable, imaginable zero one sequence in the tape. If by imaginable you mean um, a sequence which ZFZ proves to exist. ZFZ is a Miller Frankel with the axiom of choice, a classical strong meta theory. Let's conclude with a couple of fun facts about super Turing machines. One is um, this one here. So no time limit is artificially imposed on super Turing machines. They can run for as long as they wish. We, um, we use for indexing the computational steps, we use the full ordinal number line. We don't put an arbitrary upper limit, like it may only run for omega to the omega to the omega many steps. We say a super Turing machine can run for as long as it wants to. But then it's a theorem that um, either a super Turing machine holds within countably many steps, or 
it doesn't hold at all. So if it has not terminated after uncountably many steps, you can be sure that it will be it will never terminate. That it's it's trapped in some kind of loop out of which it cannot break out of. That's a result. It's not a definition. It's a result, an observation about supertermination, related to the fact that the type is the of countable size, um, but the theorem um, is deeper than just saying well the type would take countably in length. Another fun thing you can do with super Turing machines is to define when an ordinal number is called clockable. An ordinal number is called clockable if and only if there's a super Turing machine, which does whatever it wants to do on the tape, but which terminates precisely on day alpha. Not one day later, not one day earlier, precisely on day alpha. Is there a Turing machine which terminates precisely on day omega? Not on day omega plus one, but precisely on day omega. Yeah. Yeah. For instance, um, to be um, to be more precise, we would probably need to check how exactly the simulation is managed by this supertuning machine, um, so that this uh, final step of observing what has been done. Um, does not need several steps. You know? uh, but I think you can write, you're right, if you are careful in how we think, set things up, then this is possible. Um, I think the shortest example for a super Turing machine which terminates exactly on day omega is the following. This is the start state. And it um, does um, uh, the following, namely, uh, um, if it encounters a zero, then it puts a zero there and runs to the right. And if it encounters a one, then it puts a one there and runs to the right. And um, so now that's it. In particular, I'm not designating any limit state. So on day omega, the machine will not know what to do because no limit state has been designated. And so it will just stop. This is a Turing machine which super Turing machine which stops on day omega. Can you extend this super Turing machine so that it stops exactly on day omega plus two, so that it carries out two more steps and then finishes? So we have a limit state, um, which I depict like this. In this state, the Turing machine will be put on day omega and also on day two times omega, three times omega, and so on. Okay, and now it should carry out two steps and then finish. How can we draw that? I propose the following. It just does whatever. For instance, this. So if it encounters a zero, then it stays a zero and goes to the right, whatever. Then it goes into that state um, and um, then into yet another. Here again, using whatever. And then that's uh, the final state. There are no more transitions out of that state. Hence, the machine will not know what to do uh, after it has arrived at the step. Okay, if I didn't miscount, this Turing machine will terminate exactly on day omega plus two. Perhaps I did miscount and it's omega plus one or omega plus three, but you get the, get the idea. In a similar way, using more states or also by not having as many states and in contrast being more clever, we can write down a super Turing machine which terminates at day omega plus one million or one billion or whatever. We can also write down a Turing machine which uh, terminates exactly on day two omega 
or three omega or omega times omega, that is all possible. And if super Turing machines interest you, then I invite you to do this exercise and actually write down super Turing machines which terminate exactly on these days. Um, I did this talk also with high school students and also with, um, I think it's called middle school students. So students aged, let's say 14. Um, and some of them really, really like coming up with these machines. I think one uh, at some point meant to, to do this. It's, it's really fun. However, this is a non-trivial notion in the sense that it's not the case that every ordinal number is clockable. So there are ordinal numbers so that you cannot terminate precisely on that amount of days, only a bit earlier or a bit later, but not precisely on that day. And um, yeah, and hence it's an interesting non-trivial notion. And then there are a couple of theorems around it. For instance, the so-called speed up lemma. If alpha plus n is clockable, where n is a natural number, not an infinite number, but an ordinary natural number, then also alpha is clockable. So then you can somehow change the machine in, a, in such a way that, um, uh, that it doesn't require this n extra steps. And then there's um, a theorem called big gaps theorem, which in some sense, you need to be more precise, but in some sense states that there are um, gaps of arbitrary size in the um, range of clockable numbers. So at some, uh, some point, at some point on the order number line, you will encounter omega to the two many days or numbers which are all not clockable. Then you, there's a many gaps theorem not concerning the size of those gaps, but the, their amount. And then there's also in another direction, the gapless blocks theorem, which states approximately that um, for, for any bound, there's a range of numbers in the order numbers line, which are all clockable. So no clock, no gaps there. Okay, and then there's a theorem which I really, really like. It's called the lost melody theorem. The name is from the following situation, namely that you, you have some song in mind and you would ask, you would like to ask a friend, what's the name of that song? However, you don't have it so clearly in your mind that you could sing that song. And so you cannot sing it to your friend um, and, and hence you are stuck. Yeah, You would recognize the song if it would play by chance on the radio, but you cannot sing it. And the same uh, phenomenon happens with super tuning machines. There are certain infinite zero one sequences, which a super tuning machine can recognize, but not write to the tape. Yeah? So um, there's a tuning machine which correctly outputs yes or no, um, depending on whether the tape is initially filled with this special zero one sequence. Okay, so it can detect that sequence, but given a blank tape initialized with the zeros, um, no super tuning machine can write down this zero one second. Lost melody. Any questions, comments, ideas regarding this? Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Why this lost melody theorem? Yeah, great question. Um, the proof is too complex for me to right now um, explain it, but uh, if you Google infinite time tuning machines, there are two papers. There, there are a couple of papers, but there are two introductory papers, and one is this one by Joel David Hempkins and Andy Lewis. Um, uh, I think it's a very accessible paper. It doesn't require advanced knowledge. It requires familiarity with string machines and familiarity with ordinal numbers, but only more or less only on the level which you have encountered in this talk. And um, yeah, then Google for lost melody theorem, uh, Google in this document, and then you have it, theorem 4.9, and here's the proof. It's two pages, but you can totally uh, do it if you want to. 
a special task would be to formalize all of this in ACTA. However, uh, that would be quite a bit of a task for two reasons. One is, um, so this obviously rests on, requires ordinal numbers. Ordinal numbers also exist in constructed mathematics, but in fact, there exist several flavors of the ordinal numbers in constructed mathematics, and they ha have different advantages and disadvantages. Um, and uh, one would require a bit of investigation to see like which flavor is the best suited for that purpose. Um, perhaps, um, or let me say otherwise, I think probably uh, there are arguments in here which really make use of classical logic. So you need to postulate the law of student middle at some, some point. That's one reason why this will be a quite a bit of an undertaking. Then the second one is because many of those proofs um, appeal to your intuition when they describe a certain supertree mission. They say, well, it's certainly possible to write down a supertree mission which can do the following. And then you as a human think about it and use your experience in programming and then go, um, yes, that is probably doable as a supertree machine. But the paper does not try to actually write down the supertree machine because it would be a daunting task because it would have 20 states, whatever. And um, yes, so uh, in this sense, the paper is not very formal. Um, and always when you, have a, when you have source material, which is not very formal, then it will be a huge undertaking of formalizing that in ACTA because now you need to be fully formal. You cannot appeal to intuition any longer. Yeah? But still, it's, it, it might be, uh, I think, um, so if you actually formalize all of that in ACTA, then I think it should count as a PhD thesis, just so that you estimate the level. If you just formalize the first couple of pages, then it will be a nice master's thesis. Any further questions, comments? We now have two options. It's 16.6. Uh, um, uh, we are scheduled to start again, I think at 16.30. Let me check again. I just checked, but I forgot. Yes, 16.30. We can do the following. You can either just stop and, and chill. Perhaps you have random questions. Um, we could continue a little bit with that table, which you are already familiar with, but now it has a new column regarding what is realizable if we do infinite time missions. Or we could uh, uh, do those, this point-free topology stuff. What do you personally prefer? So continue point-free topology. Yes, that is definitely a good suggestion. And then, then we'll see again. Okay, good. Then let's pause at least for five minutes and then see again what we will do. <laughs> 